The bullying started when Noah was five. He was always small for his age, speckled and freckled with a shock of copper hair. He was an easy target. I kept telling him to hit back, to stand his ground. That's what I had done when I was little, but Noah wasn't me. He was gentle and kind. I have to keep reminding myself that. He liked to read and loved to watch Star Trek with me. He was a good kid. It was just a shame no one else could see it. His mum died when he was eight leaving me as his sole parent. I tried my best still do, but I'm not his mother, I'm not as gentle or kind, and my smiles don't light up a room. It's hard, doing it all alone. He misses her. Missed her. She left a hole and no one else can fill it. He came home from school one day and told me he made a friend. Martin. I was happy for him. I thought it would be good for him and that it would bring him out of his shell. I assumed it was some other kid whose peers deemed him weird and that they could take comfort in their exile with each other. He'd go to Martin's after school and come back smiling and happy. I was so relieved. Then one day Noah didn't come home. I waited half an hour, in the hopes that he was just late and that he'd lost track of the time. When he didn't show I started to get worried. I began wandering the streets looking for him. I knocked half the doors in the neighborhood before I finally called the police. They were worried too, especially when I told them Noah wasn't the sort of kid to stay out all night. He was missing for a total of two days. I can't tell you the terror I lived through. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. I wandered the streets shouting his name. All the bullies from his class suddenly found their conscience and helped by posting flyers about the town. Their parents came round with plates of food and offers of help. It takes a tragedy to make people see you, to make them help. Martin never came. You see when the police went to school to find out Martin's address they found that there was no Martin in Noah's class. There were only two Martins in my small town in fact. One was a local sex offender, and the other an elderly man up Pinewood Avenue who was bedbound. It goes without saying that I feared the worst. Then they found him. When I got the call I thought I'd be driving to a mortuary, but they sent me instead to the hospital. I got a speeding ticket trying to get there as quickly as I could. My head was buzzing. What had happened to him? Was he all right? My little Noah. When I arrived, a policeman ambushed me. He took me into a relative's room. His face was grave and I could have wept standing there, waiting. We found him in Magnolia, he said. He's completely uninjured. There's no sign of any assault. But he's... Why does there always have to be a but? Why couldn't he have been fine? Why couldn't he have wanted to come home and watch Star Trek with me? My relief died like fire in the rain. He's not. He's not responding well. We found him in an abandoned house. He was sitting alone in a room. He had been fed and watered. From all evidence at the scene, there appears to have been no restraints nor any kidnap. We're still investigating, but Noah isn't exactly forthcoming with any information. The doctors are hopeful that your presence might change that. He was in a bed, cross-legged and staring at the ceiling. He didn't even look at me as I entered. Something was wrong. One hundred thousand and three he said in his feeble little voice. Sunlight crept in through the blinds and blanketed him in strange bars. One hundred thousand and two. Noah? It's Dad. I called out to him. My words didn't seem to reach him. He was in his own world, just... counting. One hundred thousand and one. One hundred thousand, he said. Ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. Mr. McMahon? A doctor said. He was old and gray. His face was as grave as the policeman's. I'm Dr. Ald. I'm a child psychiatrist in charge of your son's care. I have a few questions for you. Firstly, I want to promise you that we are doing all we can to help Noah. Why isn't he speaking? Why is he counting? I asked. Does your son have autism? Or any mental conditions? 
Is there a history of schizophrenia in your family or his mother's side? He asked, providing me with no information. No, no autism, no schizophrenia. He's got nothing like that. Why is he like this? What's going on? Please, Doc. I glanced at him again, still counting away. I looked at my son. Noah. He is eating and drinking. He has no injuries nor any fever. My initial guess was early presenting schizophrenia, yet without any family history and his lack of reaction to medication, I find it unlikely. Dr. Ald said. To be quite honest, Mr. McMahon, I am at a loss. I have called in a colleague of mine from another hospital for a second opinion. I was hopeful he might have reacted to you. While I can rule out any physical assault, I cannot dismiss the possibility of some sort of trauma that has caused Noah's change in behavior. That sicko had hurt him in some way. He might not have laid a hand on him, but he'd put something in Noah's head. I became sure of it then. Martin. His friend hadn't been some kid from class but the neighborhood creep who had taken advantage of his loneliness. It wasn't easy leaving Noah in the hospital, but I was too angry to be of any real use to him there. A few of the dads from Noah's class told me where the creep lived. They offered to come along and help, but I didn't want to get them in trouble. This was my burden to bear. I had been such an awful father. I should have known who my son was hanging out with after school. I should have. Mindy would have. He lived in a rundown apartment complex. Graffiti had been scrubbed off the walls leaving only a thin smear of red and blue. I didn't knock, I plunged his door open. The disgusting lout was sprawled out on his couch with a roll up between his thin dried up lips. Before he could react my fist went burrowing down into his face. The sounds of him grimacing filled me with perverse pleasure. He looked confused and tried to scramble away. What the who are you? The slime bag said. Noah's father. What did you do to him? I punched again and heard his nose breaking. The ten-year-old boy you've been grooming? I ain't been grooming any ten-year-olds. Jesus fuck! He exclaimed, his forearms across his face defensively. I stopped punching. That missing kid? I told the cops already I ain't got nothing to do with that. I'm on the register, sure. Nothing to do with any kids. I'm not a Christ. It was a misunderstanding with a girlfriend that got me put on. No kids. I swear. I don't have anything to do with your kid. Believe me, please. His coffee table was stacked high with adult magazines. I believed him. I called the police on myself in the end. They were extremely sympathetic and Martin agreed not to press any charges, though I am pretty sure the stack of cannabis on the table they agreed to overlook in exchange played a part in that. Good guys, the cops in my town. I went back to the hospital. Nothing had changed. He was still counting down. Every hour the numbers grew smaller. He'd stop to sleep but when he'd wake he'd continue the count. 40,603, he said. His voice was changing. The doc said it had to do with the fact he never shut up anymore. His vocal cords were strained and raw. He sounded almost like an old man. My poor little Noah. I couldn't help but wonder what would happen when he got down to zero. Would he stop counting? What would happen when he was finished? I think the doctors were wondering that too. They were stumped. Never seen a case like Noah before, they kept saying. Why did it have to be my kid? He'd been through enough. Minby, the bullying, why him? I'm sorry, son. I said to him, he didn't look at me. I grabbed his hand which he pulled back. He used to let me hold him when he was sad. He'd come in from school with his bag slumped across his shoulders and I'd just hold him as he cried. Not anymore. Noah wasn't in there, and if he was, he was buried deep. I grabbed his hand again. I had Mindy's favorite necklace in my pocket, and I slipped it round his neck. Help me. I looked to the sky and hoped she was up there. Maybe you can reach him, I thought quietly. It's my one remaining comfort to imagine that she did. 
As the cold metal touched his neck he squeezed my hand. In between mindless numbers he looked at me. His eyes were wide with terror, like a pig at its slaughter. Dad, what's happening to me? He said. I thought I had him back. The moment died as quickly as it came. The lights switched back off and I was in the dark abyss again, searching the cold nothing for a thread of the sun I loved so much. 39,963. It isn't fair. Life. If God's real he sure likes giving us more than we can handle. We were getting down to double digits. I was sitting at his bedside and the doctors had gathered like a swarm. My tragedy was a show to them, they could go home and leave it behind. My head was in my hands. I was scared I don't know why. Unease hung in the air like a cloud. Something wasn't right, I knew that, the son I loved felt further away with every strain number. He was drifting off into the ether, and all my love would go with him. Twenty. Nineteen. He said at short intervals. There was jotting on clipboards and nurses that had paused, wordless. It felt like something was going to happen. Eighteen. Seventeen. I thought about when he was a baby, so tiny I could hold him with one hand. I thought of that first word, so pure and innocent, da da da. I thought about leaving him at school for the first time in his little uniform with the blue blazer and the tears when he came home with mud on his knees from being pushed over. I thought about Mindy and how they'd snuggle up together in bed watching some kids' films. All those fragile moments crowded my head and for a few seconds I was warm from the love of them. All the while the numbers grew smaller. Five. Four. Three. Two. There was a pause before it came. The doctors held their breath. Somewhere behind me a nurse dropped her pen and it fell to the ground slowly, as if gravity didn't work anymore. It rolled around on the floor, like a spinning hat with no momentum. One. He started convulsing. His eyes rolled to the back of his head, just little pools of white. His little body, every inch of which I adored and loved, thrashed around as if electricity was coursing through it. The nurses and doctors pushed me out of the way. All I could do was watch, as my world crumbled into nothing. Then he stopped. There was a moment of calm. He slowly pushed his way out of the nurse's grip and he sat up. I felt hope reach a crescendo within me. He's back, I thought, he's home. Then I looked at him, and it slipped away again, into a void of spreading dread. His eyes weren't his anymore. They were the same blue but they belonged to a stranger. Where am I? He asked in that strange, crackled voice. A parent knows. I can't explain it. You just know. The Noah sat on that hospital bed wasn't my Noah. He was someone else's. He looked at me as if he didn't know me. All the moisture had been drained out of me. I felt like nothing, like I would dissolve into tatters. You're in hospital, Noah, Dr. Ald said. Good, he said. He grunted and his body moved oddly. He surveyed his hands and legs as if he were just discovered them and moved as if he expected them to ache. I feel good. That's, that's excellent, a nurse said with a warm smile. Do you want some of your toys? Your dad brought you in your favorite stuffed bear? He looked at Mr. Snuffles as if he had never seen him before. My hairs were standing up. They refused to lie flat. Interesting bear, he said, judging its missing eye. He spoke as if he was older, more seasoned. This wasn't Noah, this wasn't Noah. He did not cradle it to his chest. It looked at me, that thing in my son's body and a small smile touched its lips, creeping up at the corners unnaturally. I shook my head. This couldn't be. His vitals are stable. Dr. All told me. This is good. He isn't talking like Noah. I said to him, he mused with his clipboard. He isn't acting like Noah. Whatever has happened to him has clearly had a great effect. It may take time for him to return to normal, if at all, he said. It's still Noah. He's speaking now, that means we can help. 
I took no reassurance from his words. Hours passed like days. Noah moved as if he had never had a body before, or at least a working one. He marveled at every joint and birthmark. He kept stretching his arms out just to study the way they moved. He didn't speak much. When we get home, we can watch Star Trek all weekend. I'm off work for a few weeks, I said to him, hoping to draw my son out of whatever shell he was in. I prefer M asterisk A asterisk S asterisk H, he said and I flinched. I can't wait to get home and have some kippers. Kippers and M asterisk A asterisk S asterisk H? Somewhere else in the hospital another tragedy was underway. I was wandering the halls numbly with a cup of hot coffee in my hands. The doors to ambulatory slammed open. A trolley was rushed through, a crowd of frantic family members chasing after it. An old man lay in a bed, reaching out for the sky's embrace. He was panicked, his eyes were wide like Noah's had been when he called out for me. I want my dad, I want my dad! The old man shouted at the top of his lungs. A young woman was holding onto the side of his trolley, his daughter maybe, yet the man did not seem to know her. Every time her hands came down to comfort him, he flinched. Then he saw me and his hand pulled out for me. His words seemed to have been stolen from him. He was trying to throw himself out of the trolley just to reach me. Dad! I want my dad! He shouted and the words filled my belly with dull, throbbing unease. Does your father have dementia? A doctor was asking the woman. No, he's, no, he just, he's, he's not able to get around much anymore. That's all. He's never been like this. He's been a little, down lately, about not being able to get out as much, but he's always been, sane. She said, her voice etched with pain, a pain I knew too well. Her situation was not so dissimilar to mine, a relative, not acting like themselves, the same but different. Dad, it's me. No. Dad? I want my dad, my mom. Dad? He cried, reaching out for me again. My body wanted to chase after him, to reach him. The coffee cup slipped from my hand and fell like a clatter to the ground. A pool of dark brown soaked my feet. Do you have a name so we can pull his records? The doctor asked as he followed the trolley into a room. The old man slipped out of view. Martin. The woman, still breathless, replied. His name's Martin Smith. A strange coincidence. Had to be. Little lines tied together, stitching into some awful patchwork quilt. It didn't make any sense. It couldn't be. I returned to Noah. I felt like a zombie, like my head wasn't connected anymore. It was floating in the clouds. Nothing made sense. I can't wait to come home with you, Dad. Noah said and my eyebrows furrowed. I shut my eyes and thought of my boy, at the gates of the school, in the arms of his mother. His face turned wrinkled and old. We're going to have so much fun. I just know it. He's not my kid. This thing I'm taking home. It's not my kid. Subscribe and make sure to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Linked at the top of the description. Either way, thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you guys next time.